Push this book just out of the way a little bit. So you can see your beautiful face. Mm. Beautiful. Hey, so I wanted to ask you, I actually don't even know where you where you grew up. I grew up in Shelton, Washington, which was a small logging town. Oh really? And I my friends were all dope smoking type kids who, whose fathers were loggers and when they got disciplined, it was with their fist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a belt. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so that's that's where I grew up. Did you have any introduction to art at a young age at all, or? I did because my my father, who is a sci was a scientist, chemist, uh, wanted to be an artist. Yeah. I was always more literary. That's why I was an illustrator. I like stories. I like to illustrate stories. So when you were a little kid, did you imagine yourself like being an illustrator someday, or was no, it just kind I of? I didn't. I didn't know what that word was. Yeah. The thing that <clears throat> influenced me the most was Andy Warhol. So when oh, wow. when images by him and his factory and stuff started showing up in Life magazine, yeah, to me that just seemed like the coolest thing. Ever. Interesting. That's what I wanted to be. Wow. But I didn't know how to get there. And my, my family, my father was very, he had a PhD in chemistry. Yeah. And we'd go to art museums all the time. Wow. So I, it wasn't like art wasn't uh, unfamiliar to me. Yeah. But commercial art. I moved to the East Coast when I was in my senior year of high school. And I was in oh, a wow. class full of executives' children. And... They all wanted to go to Rhode Island School of Design. Hmm. And at that point in time, I didn't know there was actual colleges that were just all art. Yeah. I thought you had to go to a university and study in the art department. And then I met some of the other kids that were in the illustration department. Yeah. They seemed like they were having a lot more fun. So when I was in art school, I had, I had fellow illustrator majors who's family members were illustrators and they had grown up in that world and yeah. they knew all, all about stuff. So. Yeah, like the Norman Rockwell world and stuff. Yeah, and I didn't have a clue. You know? So by the time I graduated, after you know, I moved back in with my parents and I didn't know what to do. And I admired a particular artist, his name was Alex Najago. Hmm top flight illustrator at the time. Yeah. And he did the cover of one of the illustrator's annuals, so I bought that annual, and it, you know, because I loved his work. Yeah. And in the back, they had the artist's information, like where they lived. And I thought, well, I wonder where he lives. <laughs> he lived two blocks from my parents. You're kidding me. Wow. So I mustered all my courage <laughs> and went over and knocked on his door. And his wife answered. Oh my God! And I mumbled and stumbled something. I don't know what I said. Even though she teased me for years after that, that I was a, like a blabbering idiot. You know? But he took me under his wing, and he wow. mentored me, Holy and cow. he got me my first illustration jobs and taught me how to be a professional. That's amazing. I don't think I would have ended up an illustrator without him. That is an amazing I, I story. You don't learn how to do stuff like that in art school. Yeah. You learn how to make art. Yeah. You make pictures and stuff. But you don't learn how to get a job. No. Like that. And what was his thing? Was he like a, a he, watercolor? He was a, no, he was an editorial illustrator. So he yeah. illustrated for Penthouse and hmm. all the major magazines, record companies. Wow. He was he, he was a hugely successful illustrator. Yeah. And he had mentored other people. So by the time I showed up, he had a his technique down, so to speak. Did he accept you right away, or is it kind of weird, or how did the first meeting go? He, we chit-chatted and stuff, and he more or less um, said, bring some examples of your work. Yeah. 
So I did, and it was the work I had done in art school. Yeah. And he more or less summed it up. These, these are nice and everything, but you're not going to get any work from this kind of work. No. Now, how old, how old were you at this point? In your 20s? Yeah, like 22, 23. Oh, yeah, so you're pretty young. Yeah. First thing that happens when you go into Manhattan with your portfolio is you feel like the teeny tiniest little speck of nothingness because it is so daunting, it's so huge. Yeah, Buildings yeah. are so big, and you're going to go see somebody on the 80th floor in suite 175, <laughs> right? And you're just like, it's it's intimidating, yeah. and you keep failing. Yeah. And pretty soon you start thinking, yeah, I really picked a good career. <laughs> you know? And then finally you get a break, something will happen, you get, a, you get an opportunity. A lot of the opportunities I had were because my mentor set them up for me. Yeah. You know, so I what got an incredible a foot feel right door. there. Well, I've always wanted to like pay that forward, but the opportunities to do that are, are very difficult. I mean, you know. But I think that's a really important thing to know is like you actually mustered the courage to do that, you know. So you could have said, oh, I'm, I don't never I'm going to meet this guy or I'm never going to go up that to the 80th floor, but you actually did it, you know. And when you get rejected, you kept on doing it. If you just are lazy and kind of dabble at it, you're doomed. You're gonna get eaten alive. Yeah, you got no shot. So, so then, what was your fi your first like real break? <clears throat> My first real break was I got published in Penthouse Magazine. Oh really? Um, that was a big one. Wow. And it was scary. Yeah. But what year was this? <sighs> 78, something like that. Oh, yeah. And then I, I had all kinds of really great job opportunities over time. And some of them, one, I, I had a job doing the invitation for the Masters Golf Tournament that was for, for CBS. Holy right. crap. At that time, it was essentially, it had serial numbers, and so it was sent to the President of the United States, yada, yada. Wow. But... It corresponded when I, I contracted mononucleosis, and I had to get this job done. I did an all-nighter or two, and I, had, I was getting really sick. And I, and, but I finished the job, and I took it into the art director, and she said, this is really fantastic. Now I want you to move these figures over one inch. Now my technique was oil painting, Yeah. right? And so moving something, and the most complicated part of it, the figures, yeah, yeah. moving them over an inch, <laughs> and I need it tomorrow. Oh my God. And so I had a temperature by that point of 102. Jeez. And I worked all night long moving those figures, and I brought that in the next day, and only youth can survive that kind of <laughs> rigorous... And so I never even saw the finished product because they, they only published like 700 of them and they went to all business tycoons and stuff like wow. that. Wow. But it won an art director award. When you see an illustration that's fabulous, it's, it's a very impressive thing because that person went through the same rigors. Yeah. You know, no, hardly no time. So you got to be creative on demand. And you got to make it look fantastic and artistic. Yeah. You know, and those two things are really tough to yeah. do quickly. I, I have known illustrators who can't work without an assignment. Yeah. I mean, they, they need to yeah. be told what needs to be painted. Yeah. They don't make pictures just willy-nilly on their own. Yeah. It's a waste <laughs> of time. They don't make any money doing that. I, I mean, seriously, they were that yeah. kind of mindset. And yeah, so, yeah. Um, I was never that way. I was always fiddling around with my own stuff, procrastinating to get the job done. <laughs> yeah. it, I just loved to make pictures and about whatever at any given time I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah, you you have such unique subject matter, you know, and your the characters in your paintings are so. 
I guess the only way to describe them is they're just yours, you know, like you have a real unique, you know, and that's a lot of artists, you know, that's what they seek their whole lives to do is to create characters, you know, and I think you've really done an amazing job at that. Thank you. And what, uh, when did those, were those characters always like in your head or are they sort of slowly developed or? I, I would say slowly developed. I went through a period where I liked to distort things the way I saw Picasso distort them. Yeah. And even though I could never imitate anybody else's art, it always looked like my art. Yeah. Even if I tried to forge something, it yeah. would turn out as my art. I, that's, I don't have the ability to copy. But I would get into distortions and all kinds of things because I love to look at other people's art. And over time, you make those distortions your own. Yeah. They become, and it's because I draw a lot. Yeah. You know, drawing is the key to having your own kind of imagery. I, my head is big, <laughs> and the body will be little. It's that simple. And I, I learned that from Norman Rockwell. Yeah. People always think his art is realistic. Yeah. I mean, he makes giant feet. Yeah, yeah. Big giant hands. Yeah, yeah. Big giant heads. <laughs> <laughs> I stole a lot of his ideas. It seems like with the people in your paintings, they they kind of imitate the world around you, yes. or they're like reflections of the world around you. Is that something that's always been an interest of yours? Is I think it's much more of an interest of mine now that I've moved into and I live in a city. Yeah. Prior to that, I think my art was more fantasy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And more animals and just weird things that would pop into my imagination. Yeah. But now that I live in a city, and I'm an urban surrealist, yeah. that, um, I try and pull my ideas from what I see in the city. Yeah. And I, I just do it nonstop. You know, like yesterday, there was two police cars, an ambulance, and a fire truck dealing with my neighbor across the street. <laughs> now, I don't know what was going on over there. A lot of action. A lot of action was going on over there. <laughs> but suddenly, as I was looking at it out my doorway, because, you know, it's like a train wreck, you want to look at it. <laughs> this idea of, popped into my head, of this whole mess of operation, because this beautiful woman had fainted, and they're all... But on this side of the painting is a homeless guy that's a total mess, Laying on the ground and no one cares. Fainted, yeah. It's bizarre, huh? And that's how my brain just thinks stuff up. You know, I'm looking at something real. Yeah. And into my mind comes a weird analogy. Yeah. And it's everywhere you look, you see this kind of intense energy of people doing stuff, and either you you're absorbed in your own morass, or you notice what's going on around you, and it's fodder. Yeah. So. All of these things come into your brain, and then your brain cooks something up. It takes yeah. these pieces and just, you know, they burble up yeah. from the subconscious. They wheeled a woman out in a gurney, and there was another woman, and she was all animated, talking to <laughs> them. What did those two do? You know? I'm really curious. Did you always have that curiosity? Yes. Yeah. I got scolded one time when I was a kid. <laughs> I was walking down the sidewalk and I looked in somebody's window and there was a, a woman on the ground or on the floor of her house and there was a man standing over her and in my imagination he just, you know, pounded on her. Yeah, yeah. Right? And he looked up and he saw me staring and he comes out the door and he goes, you got a nose problem? Wow. And I'm thinking, my nose? <laughs> I didn't get the analogy. <laughs> But I kept moving because he was very aggressive. <laughs> you have a whim very whimsical nature about your work. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, it's fun. Like, and you said it's urban, so it could be a lot of dirty stuff and maybe stuff that people don't necessarily want to see or seek out, but you make it whimsical, so it makes it very approachable. And, uh, you know, there's a side of me that wants to present people shooting up dope and, yeah. <laughs> and street walkers and bad, all kinds of activity. Because I see that all the time. Yeah. And I'm tempted to do that, but I, I acknowledge that 
Let's face it. You're here to sell paintings. Yeah. And people are going to live with those paintings. It's a. This is a sophisticated endeavor where you're. You are editing and you are telling people things and you are slipping the dark side in there. Just tweaking. Well, you're a communicator. Yeah. So it's a difference between just being a hermit in the woods and being someone who lives in society, you know. And I have been the hermit in the woods. Yeah. And you came out. And it's not successful. You're somebody that like actually goes out in the street and you're walking around and you're, you know what I mean? That's... Instead of just like looking at it on TV, you're seeing it in person. You're smelling it. I would. I really wish I could take photos of the things I see. They're too intimate. So I try and remember stuff. Yeah. Like for a long time in in my career, I I would draw from my memory of things I would see, and I taught myself to see more stuff. You know, like you see a beautiful woman, and you, and you you go to draw her, and you go. I don't even remember what kind of shoes she had. Yeah. So what you do is you teach yourself to see all the details, mm -hmm. and then you can depict it from your memory. Right? But it's training. I'm not like a Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. I stretch the imagination. Yeah. I have selective. But sometimes the things in the background are the most interesting yeah, things. Yeah. That's the way I view it. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of people, they want to go to a ball game and, and watch the picture. Yeah. You know, pitch no hitter. <laughs> and then there's the people sitting over there, what are they doing? You know? <laughs> I mean, it's all the what you see. So do you have a daily routine where you're in the studio? I do. I, I, I am a lunchbox guy, and I'm proud of it now. I bring my lunch to work. I, I work 10 hours a day, six days a week. Yeah. I, I actually took a day off this weekend. Yeah. I took Saturday off, and... We drove around. I saw all kinds of stuff. I, I found like six paintings and amazing wandering around on my day off. But that's a good example of like you just you have to do. You know, you can't just your imagination sit needs fuel. Absolutely. Even though like you you have weird dreams. Yeah. And you wake up. And you know, I know I had a weird dream. I don't have any idea what that was about. Yeah. Right? Other times, you, as you're waking up, your brain will put together an image and float up. Exactly, yeah. And I'll, I'll capture those. But most of the time, the imagination needs information. Yeah. It needs imagery. It needs a nonstop. Constantly. So, like, if, if I was in prison and I yeah. only had that <laughs> little cubicle and I had a stack of paper and pencils, yeah, I could draw the entire time yeah. from my imagination. Yeah. But eventually it would start to get repetitive. Exactly. Because there's no new stimulus coming in. Yeah. Right? So. That's a good way of point it, pointing it out. Now, a lot of people get a lot of stimulus from watching television, reading yeah. books, and seeing movies and stuff like that. And that's good too. Yeah. I mean. But it's not the same though. Not the same because you're absorbing other people's creative activity. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to ask you about urban surrealism and. Um, Get your definition of it, and All right, so now I live in a city, and to me, cities are incredible because they're filled with human energy, human story. Yeah, and the stories I see are are the random ones that I bump into, just as everybody else bumps into their own stories. So, the ability to depict the stories is what the urban surrealist does. Hmm. So I was a pop surrealist, and to a degree I still am. Right? So my imagery is from nostalgia, and pop culture, and products, and memories, and all that stuff. But now my source is the city itself, and the human en energy, and the way people interact. Driving down the same street, and there was a guy panhandling, and he had on a ski mask. You know, the type with the holes. It's the old eyes. school kind of. And it's about 85 degrees. <laughs> he had no shirt on and a ski mask on. And he was panhandling. And I'm thinking, that's an aggressive yeah. image. You know? <laughs> he will be my third ski mask guy. Really? I saw a guy ride his bike by my studio window with a ski mask on and a two foot long machete. And he was angry. Oh my God! Yeah, 
<laughs> and I thought, that's a good way to get shot by the police, frankly. <laughs> Just that outfit alone. But I, I, he ended up in one of my paintings. That's how stuff that you see, it, you don't just depict it the way it's presented. That's yeah, the, like exact. It's, it's literally. It's a, it becomes an element. Yeah. And so the city is just this great, surreal place of human energy and interaction and weird stuff. And everybody sees it. Yeah. And, you know, think about all the stories and the movies and everything that comes out of the city. And it, it's all, we, we all see it. It's turning it into something tangible. Yeah. And that's where it's really Interesting. Yes. Cool. <laughs> hey, well, thanks, buddy. Thank you. Great talking to you. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Yeah.